all square at the Battle of the Bridge. Hello and welcome to episode 12 of the Real Football Cast. I'm your host Dan Tracy and in the next 60 minutes we will be dissecting all the hot topics in football. After tweaking the format slightly last week due to the international break, we return for better or worse to our usual format. I hope you like Kicked in the Bin as it's definitely a topic we will visit soon. With the Champions League action taking place in a few hours, it is an earlier than usual recording and that also means the long awaited return of JS. Now the podcast loss has been journalism's gain as of late, but more importantly, how have you been my friend? Um, yeah, a bit under the weather actually, Dan. I was ill in bed for about a week, so, uh, yeah, so, sort of on the mend, generally perky and positive, though. How are you doing? Yeah, all good, mate, all good. So, I've thankfully not been under the weather, but, um, yeah, just just slogging on, really, uh, as we get into these autumnal evenings, so, um, mm. yeah, I'm absolutely fine. So, let's, uh, let's get cracking. It's just JS running the channels on his own on this one, but as we've got plenty to catch up on, we'll be absolutely fine, so no worries there. Um, I'll best do some social media bits first, as we'll be talking into the abyss once more. First, if you want to get in touch with me, you can. I'm on Twitter, at DanTracy1983. Anything show-related, send it my way. You can find me via iTunes by searching for Real Football Cast. And if you use that platform, don't forget to subscribe, so you'll never miss a single episode. And if you're not a fan of all things Apple, you can also find me on SoundCloud or Acast. While the easiest way to find all the links is going to realfootballcast.com. As you should know by now, the Real Football Cast is sponsored by Loserpool. And what is Loserpool, I hear you ask? It is a new game that sees betting turned on its head, with a focus being on the loser. If this has grabbed your interest, then be sure to visit loserpool.com and create an account, especially as you can still sign up for the prize pool, which guarantees a winner £1,000. Something you will not want to miss out on. Right then, it's time to go live. And where should we go first? Actually, for a change, let's go to La Liga. Yeah, we're going to sun it up for a bit. And the El Clasico is on the horizon. Now, this week, it will be a messiless El Clasico as the Argentinian has injured his shoulder. That came in the 4 2 win over Sevilla last weekend. At the same time, though, if you were a Barcelona manager, or shall I say, if you were Ernesto Valverde, it's probably the one addition to this game you could get away with him not playing. Reason being that Real Madrid lies seventh at present and have just recorded their longest ever goal drought. Now, they suffered another defeat at the weekend, and JS, where has it all gone wrong for Yuna Lopetegui? Joe, you know, I was, um, <clears throat> was having this debate with someone yesterday. Um, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think they're right at the moment, Rail. I, I don't like the way they basically did their, you know, international version of shit housing by basically announcing that it was joining, what was it like, in the middle of World Cup preparations or whatever. And I do actually think, like, the Spanish FA were right to tell him to do one. Um, I, th- I think that's a big part of it. Obviously, Zidane's a huge figure at the club, you know, club legend, already tripled by his managerial success. So that's going to be a huge thing. R- Ronaldo leaving... He, I, I dislike him in general, but he's such a great player. He's going to make any team in world football weaker. Um, you have to think players like Modric, who still looks fantastic, but Modric and Ramos are, what are they, 33 and 34 or something now? They're, they're not, they're not going to be able to compete at that top top level for that much longer and that's probably where Ronaldo has been quite clever in going to a team where there's slightly less expected of them in in Europe I mean obviously everyone expects Juve to win the uh, Scudetto but that I mean that's a given with or without without Ronaldo isn't it so where has it gone wrong? Yeah, losing Ronaldo, um, the way they hired hired uh, Ulan Lopetegui, um, bit of a down downfall in form. They seem to be they seem to have a proliferation of sort of central midfielders who can all do similar things. They need to sort that out because you've already seen Kovacic um, being farmed out to Chelsea, and he's looked fantastic for them. 
I think Madrid could do with Kovacic. They, they, they don't seem to have as many goals in them as they did before, and obviously some were coming with, uh, you know, from Ronaldo. I think Bale would have been better served moving back to the Premier League, either to our beloved Spurs or maybe to United. Um, there's just... They, they need a refresh, like really from start start to finish they they just need a complete refresh of the team um and the thing is about Loppa degree who they they coveted they did the whole thing where they they essentially kind of coaxed him out of the spanish manager's job they announced it before the world cup so there was a lot of ill will towards them even from their own fans um their own fans famously impatient, they're border impatient. I can't see Lopper Degree surviving for that long. Um, obviously it upset the balance of what Spain were trying to do at the World Cup and the whole thing's a complete mess. I, I don't think the continued um, Ronaldo um, reopening of the rape investigations helped either because you, you kind of think of everything Ronaldo, uh, sorry, Real did for Ronaldo over the years. And now Ronaldo is basically throwing Madrid under a bus and basically saying, they made me pay her off. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? It's just all these little things off and on the field are really upsetting everything they have there at the moment, you know? If we look to the El Clasico itself, say Real Madrid do lose, is that the uh, the last hurrah for Lopetegui? Is he sacked after that? And if so, who fills the gap there? Because... At that point of the season, we're looking at what? The end of October. So two months mm. into a season, the managerial landscape is somewhat settled. So mm. there's no real obvious candidate. Do they look for an interim safe pair of hands, what like they did with the uh, post Rafa Benitez, where I wouldn't say they got lucky, but they got Zidane in and they, mm. and they did great for three years? Or do they sort of look for someone like Antonio Conte, who could not only be a safe pair of hands, but could come in straight away and start that revolution early? Yeah, um, uh, hasn't, hasn't, oh yeah, Conte, sorry, sorry, I was thinking of, um, oh, what's wrong with me, and I was thinking of Ancelotti for some reason when you said that, um, if, if, if Conte can't handle the egos in the dressing room at Chelsea, he's going to get eaten alive at Rail, there's, that, that, that wouldn't, that wouldn't work there, especially if, well, actually if, if Jose Mourinho can't handle the egos at the Real Madrid dressing room and Conte couldn't handle the egos in the Chelsea dressing room, he's going to get absolutely eaten alive at Real. I don't think that would be a good choice. If if they do sack Klopp at degree this early on, I, I'm going to be genuinely livid about that because I, I do think Real do kind of feel they can ride rough, rough shot over a lot of European football. And then when they did it to the national team, that really fucks me off. It really upset the balance of their World Cup. And this is really now getting to the stage where it, they kind of feel like they're bigger than international teams. And that's where, that's where football dies for me. So if they then just sack him after what nine ten games because they've decided he's not good enough to sort of sort all of this out but i'm just it's, it's going to make my blood boil i swear to god you you'll see me in the uh, the cardiac unit next week in my local hospital let's uh play devil's advocate and let's say that lopetegui is sacked for better or worse and then um there's a, a safer pair of hands at season through to the end of the season and then the merry-go-round really picks up a pace. And then do Tottenham fans have cause to be worried if Lopetegui gets sacked? Because then that, that link surfaces its ugly head again, doesn't it? It, de it depends what happens. I mean, I, th I think fundamentally Pochettino is quite a sensible bloke. Um, I think he still likes the idea of building a dynasty at Spurs. I, I don't think he's a mercenary. I mean, you know... Levy's already get, just given him a two and a half million a year pay rise and pay rises for his three musketeers. So I, I think he's one of those sensible managers that would look at the Madrid job, look at its record and look at the risk and reward. Because, you know, he might go there and win like a Champions League and still get fired. 
he might go and win three La Ligas in a row and lose two Champions League finals and still get fired. I, I, I just don't think he's that kind of bloke. You, you know, I, I don't think he'll look at it and go, that's a poison chalice. Um, I don't think he's stupid enough to, to kind of go there and think everything will be great even if I'm winning, I, I, I just, I can't, I can't see it, you know what I mean, I just, I can't see him making the decision to do that, if, if Pochettino were to leave Spurs, he would go to a club that had a lot more stability to it, it would be to somewhere like, uh, you know, Man, Man City or somewhere like that. If he was going to go to a to a money club, because they're they're not really trigger happy at City. Um, PSG, if he wanted to do one of those kind of stopgap ones, it's that's really a win win because you know if you do get fired, you you've made a ridiculous amount of money. But if he goes to Madrid and fails. It, it, there, there's going to be limited clubs he could go to after that. I, I, I see him being a bit more of a sensible type, a bit like Pep, going to somewhere like Bayern Munich or somewhere like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean let's let's hope that. Well, let's hope he doesn't go anywhere unless he, you know, just stays in Tottenham. But I think you're right. I think he's sort of would he trade everything he's got and the opportunity to be the, the modern day Bill Nicholson, as it were, and create that real legacy at the club and trade that in for the quick wins of a couple of Champions League. And then that's maybe yeah. the short route to success, but the longer route would be the one that's more than worthwhile, isn't it? So I, you know. I, I, I agree. And even if, to look at it at the worst possible case, and we do lose him, I don't think he would go to a club like Chelsea or like Real Madrid, where they're so trigger happy with their managers. I do genuinely believe it would be to a, a really stable club like Bayern Munich or even like Manchester City where they really do back the managers. They really do give them a lot of time. You know, I, he's, a, he's a sensible bloke. It would be risk and reward. If he goes to a top-level European job, you know, even Man United, something like that, you, you know what I mean? I, uh, I can see him going to one of those kind of clubs. I can't see him going and risking it all at rail for a couple of seasons i think he's he's clearly got good advisors um he's got a sensible head on his shoulders i i can't i, I can't see him doing it i just can't see him taking the madrid job yeah i, I think on the balance of probabilities you're probably right for the, uh, the reasons you've laid out but let's go to the premier league now and uh first we'll go to the emirates as it's freshest in the memory as it took place last night Arsenal and Mesut Ozil in particular were purring as they eventually come out on top against Leicester. They're the form team at the moment, JS. Mm. What can they do to bridge the gap to be considered real title contenders and not just also rans? Do you know what? Um, funnily enough, I was having a similar discussion about this yesterday as well. I, I don't think they're... I, I don't actually think they've quite got enough to bridge the gap to the, the top four this year, let alone... Definitely not a title challenge this year. Um, I'll, I'll explain. I, I, I still think Spurs, Chelsea, City and Liverpool will be the top four simply because I think they have better strength in depth in their squads than Arsenal do. And doing that Thursday... Um, Sunday things are killer. We we know about this. It's almost like that perpetual limbo where you you can't break the cycle because the Thursday Sunday things knackering, and I do believe that will catch up with them at some point over the season. Um, Emery's got them playing really nicely. I actually watched that game yesterday. It was really entertaining. Um, Arsenal played some really good football. Guendouzi looks like an incredibly gifted young footballer. I think they've got the bones there. I think this season will be, be a bit too soon for them. But I think if Emery, for example, gets in a couple of decent players in January, you know, maybe even if it's like Ndombele to go with Guendouzi, you know, although they do similarish things, but can you imagine the two of them in a pivot? 
I, I can't imagine when those two had got a lot of experience, any anybody would be getting through with them. It would be like having Mini Vieira and Mini Roy Keane in the same team or something. But um, what have they got to do? I, I, I. I I, I don't think they've got enough to win a title in the next few years. Um, I do think they'll be in the top four again next year, which, you know, is going to be highly dependent on Spurs, how Spurs and probably Liverpool go over the next year and what we do with transfers and stuff like that. So, um, But they do look good. They definitely look better. Just don't think the squad, the squad depth in terms of quality is there this year to probably even get in the top four. Definitely not as high to challenge. It's now seven straight league wins for them, and all of them have come where they've drawn at half time. And I tipped this to happen on Sunday. I said, if you've got any smart money, bet on that, and it happened. So whether someone took my advice, <laughs> I don't know. But it does show that they're prepared to, to dig in. They don't necessarily have to dig into the end, they didn't mm-hmm. have to last night. But does it also show they have got a plan B when they need it? Because they're sort of Emery's sort of willing to change tact. He's got options off the bench that can turn a draw into a win. And if you compare it to last season, they wouldn't have won seven in a row in that situation under Wenger. It probably would have been nearer sort of three or four, wouldn't it? Yeah, I agree. And I, I think you know last season and probably the season before they were kind of like how Spurs used to be, you know, in the, the sort of inter-Champions League years, uh, where we'd play attractive football, but we didn't have a lot of bite or backbone to us. They, they reminded me a lot of us in that era. Um, Emery seems to have come in. I do, I do think having someone like Gwen Deuce has helped. He just looks like he wants to, you know, kill everyone who has the ball if his team doesn't have it. You know what I mean? He looks like he wants to hunt people down and go through them. And um, they they haven't had that for so many years. And I, I, th- I think, like I said, bringing in people like Lichsteiner, who's quite a hard guy as well, just having that voice in the dressing room is, is a huge thing. And they actually look like a more committed squad again. Um, they they look like they've got got a bit of steel back, and I think that was one of the sort of key um, elements at Sevilla when Emery had them as well. He'd make sure they played games for ninety minutes, didn't give up, and I think that's reaping dividends for Arsenal at the moment. Yeah, I think you're right. In terms of uh, the team they beat last night, Leicester, the uh, the funny statistic there: they've not drawn a game this season. They either win or they lose. Now um, that sort of Guarantees you mid-table football coming into the season. Yeah. Is that enough to keep Claude Pio in a job? I mean, he keeps sort of being linked that he's under pressure. Um, we've seen when he was Southampton manager, even finishing eighth wasn't enough to keep him in, in employment oh, in the season. Man. So what do what do Leicester define a success this season? What does Pio need to do to stay in a job? I mean, Just, just, just a very quick one on that Claude Pio one at Southampton. The absolute state of that club at times, you know. Um, my my dad's a Saints fan. He 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 hates Spurs because he feels we we were their downfall. Um, because basically we nicked their manager and all their players, and then I pointed out we've pretty much only had bail off them in a few years, you know. But he doesn't listen. But as as for Claude Pugh, I, I don't know what's up with their board. They just do it to themselves. They finish eighth get to a cup final and they're like, no, that isn't enough. It's like, what in their heads do their board think they should be doing? Like, winning the FA Cup and finishing in what? Like, the European places or above? Is that really what they thought any other manager was going to come in and do? Well, yeah, absolutely. And now it's sort of diminishing returns, isn't it? Because you look at Southampton a few years back, you know, under sort of, uh, Pochettino and Koeman, this mm. constant mm. conveyor belt of talent. And, you know, they're still producing young players, but they've lost that identity, haven't they? They lost that thing that sort of made them a great team to watch and just on the precipice of European yeah. places and getting into Europe. And now it's this sort of death by a thousand cuts almost, isn't it, under Mark Hughes? And you it's, of- it sounds super harsh, but they, they kind of look a bit like Stoke did for years. You yes. know what I mean? They're, they're not like, at least Swansea always had that sort of free flowing attacking football. Wasn't always effective, but it was at least good to watch. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, Leicester, 
less than a god. What what should they be doing? I mean, they've had no real influx of you know money since the days of um, when they pumped in like I think it was fourth or fifth most amount that season. They won it. Um, they don't really seem to have in, reinvested the Mares or the the Kante money particularly, or certainly not particularly well. And that's right. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. The <sighs> well, you'd say like mid table is just par, isn't it? Like if they finish tenth, I don't think that's a disgrace at all. Really, I don't think it's something that For, lends itself to being as as an outsider of Leicester. <laughs> And I've now got a sp- soft, a bit of a soft spot for them because of how they won the league against all the odds and all the rest of it. But as an outsider, should should Leicester really be finishing above tenth now? They keep selling off all their best players. Well, that's right, isn't it? They shouldn't, should they? No. But your your question was, what would the board consider successful for Puel not to get sacks? Who knows? Where where do you think their board thinks they should be? Challenging for the European places, maybe? I mean, well, like, yeah, Euro- yeah. Europa League, you know, obviously. Yeah, I think everyone in that bracket, let's say, like, Leicester, Everton, Wolves, maybe even Watford, like, they all want to be this best of the rest, don't they? And they think, like... Burnley you know, as yeah, well. Yep, like, yeah, so if we can't finish six, let's at least be seventh and maybe get into the Europa League. And it's like, if we're not yeah. seventh, then that's failure. But... That's mm-hmm. a really hard objective to sort of go for because only one team can be that, and then yep. you've got five, maybe six teams gunning for that one. So then you've got have five teams failed, and you think, well, no, not really. It's just that no. you know the gap between seventh and tenth. It's how can one be successful and one not really? Because ultimately they're not that dissimilar, are they? So it's very, very hard. I mean, if it was like seventh and fifteenth, you think, okay, it's a bad season, but to finish tenth with that kind of group of clubs you're competing with i don't think that's a disgrace but it's a bit like it's a bit like the first to sixth thing isn't it it's like genuinely almost no say we fast forwarded to the end of the season and hadn't played a game yet and you saw the top six in almost any order there's there's almost nothing that would shock you in in what the order was. You know what I mean? Unless it yeah. was, say, City had finished sixth, for example. But re- really, if, say, City were top two and someone else had won it, no huge shocks. And I agree with you, seventh to tenth, there's no huge shocks there. I mean, you know, and like you say, they're bored. So unless they get super lucky and have, you know, get someone in like... Um, Eddie Howe at Bournemouth, who clearly has a track record of being able to improve the club out of all recognition on very, very little. You know, they're, they're going to struggle. I mean, I, I think Everton are probably looking pretty good out of that lot this year. But they're, they're so patchy as well, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, they've hit form at the moment, but that's only, I think, three wins in a row. But... Three in a row is amazing for Everton because that's... That's nine. That's nine points. Obviously, that just really pushes you away from the rest and puts pressure on them. You know. Yeah, because they had quite a sort of sluggish start. Really, I think it was only one win in the first five. Albeit they drew three of those. It wasn't kind of crisis, but for the sort of expenditure and the dreams that they had, you're thinking, oh, hang on. Like, oh, and done? actually, I think they were a bit unlucky, and uh, I definitely, definitely, at least one of the games I watched, they lost. You know, in some of the games they drew, they should have won and all the rest of it. Like that, Ever- Everton could have been in the top four at the moment. It- it's one of those just real, like, do you know what I mean? They're having a really unlucky season. If so, you know, just little terms of the, it's not quite going their way at the moment. Or, or rather, it wasn't. It clearly is now. So I, I think they're going to do quite well. I-, I think they might, you know sort of even be challenging for sixth this year when it when all is said and done. We'll go to the team which has uh, at least got hopes of top six, and that's Man United. And uh, Stamford Bridge is where they played on Saturday, where it was on as even. Although mm. it must be said the column inches were written more about proceedings on the touchline at the end than opposed yeah. to actually on the pitch. So first, I'd like your um, thoughts on the scuffle or the sort of the set two, and then was the draw a right result? So a sort of two-part question, if you could um, fire away on that one. Oh, God. Uh, 
to be honest, it, it's, it's probably going to sound really bad, but I actually found the scuffle quite funny. That's exactly what I was going to say. Because, you know, in Punch Out, oh, we don't want to see that. And you're like, actually, yeah, we didn't want to see that. Actually, yeah, we do. It's like, I was, I was reading some of the reactions, and th- this is a perfect example of how, how middle class football has become now. There was some, like, I mean, clearly edu- quite well educated people on there going, oh, this is shocking. It shouldn't be in the game. And you're there, like, fucking hell, mate. Have you ever even been to a football match? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's fun. I want to see that passion. And then it was like the FA are going to give the clubs warnings, and it's like, yeah, that's fine because the FA are kind of going, yeah, we sort of need to be seen to be doing something about it. But really, that's going to mean fuck all. It's not like they've slapped them with fines and touchline bans. Yeah, do do I love the? Chelsea head of sports science or whatever he was like running up the touchline and <laughs> celebrating wildly right in front of Mourinho and then Mourinho reacting and then all the squads of course I do like as long as it doesn't go stupidly far and people are literally getting broken noses and stuff like that he you know, it was it was pretty handbags the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's not it's not like they suddenly started pulling out baseball bats and chainsaws. You know what I mean? It was like it was okay. I want to see that. I want to see a bit of fire and and passion. You know, I, I want to see that from players and managers. You know, and so I thought that was great. Um, yeah. So I think the draw. Um, yeah, I think that, that, that probably was about a fair result on balance, I think. I, I, I think Chelsea pretty much um, uh, dominated it. Uh, not necessarily dominated it, but I, I felt they were in control of the game until United scored, and then they seemed to get their tails up, and it really looked like United were just going to run away, run away with it after that. And fair play to Chelsea. They really, really dug in. Um, and yeah, that that was that was quite nice to see. And yeah, and I do. And there's nothing like a sort of, even though it wasn't a winner, it kind of felt like one for them. There's nothing better in football than that, is there? Where you think all hope's gone, and then in the dying seconds, someone just bangs one in. I I thought that was a great game. You know, I made the cardinal sin. I was watching in the pub, and I made the cardinal sin of leaving in the 95th minute because I was oh, like, and what, was, what are what, you doing with your life? Oh more, my god! What was more strange is for about four hours i was still under the impression that united won so i sort of then looked on twitter and everyone's going about this ross barkley goal and i was like why are you talking about ross barkley's goal against southampton and it's just that was just like another planet and then, <laughs> then it dawned on me i was like what two all like what an idiot and i was just really cross to myself so lesson learned on that one never leave yeah. it regardless ever but, no never um united are, seems to be they're playing their best when they're behind and now that is a strategy that has earned them Four points in the last two matches, but at the same time, it's not really one you can get away with on a weekly basis. So, more, more importantly, how can they turn in better performances from minute one? <laughs> My, do you, do you know, you know, you know that game, the um, the the free association game, where someone says something and then you have to say the first thing that comes into your head. Yes. When you asked me that question, literally the first words that came into my head were sack Mourinho. Well, you know, that's um, not necessarily wrong answer. So, so that's clearly how I feel deep down. But I, I don't like I don't like the football they play under Mourinho. Um, in fact, I've rarely liked any football any team has ever played under Mourinho, to be honest. And whilst obviously I'm not like... I want United to get back to the glory days. I mean, I'm a Spurs fan, but I don't hate them as much as I'm, I hate, you know, our normal rivals. And it's weird to see, let's be honest, they they are the jewel in the crown of the English club slash league system, aren't they? It's a bit like, you know, AC Milan or Juve or Barca or... Uh, <laughs> the other ones, Real Madrid. You, you, you know what I mean. And yeah. I, I'm. It's not like I want to see them winning loads again because obviously I'd like to see Tottenham step up and start winning things. But that famous red shirt, you know, the shirt of George Best and 
Bobby Charlton and, oh, you know, throughout history, Canton are these great players or flying wingers like Giggs or even Ronaldo when he was there. I, I want to see those famous red shirts flying down wings, you know, scaring defences and sort of being being Man United again. It was like, I don't know if you caught any of, um, did you catch Ajax's game the other week in the Champions League? No, I didn't, mate, sorry. It was, it was, oh no, I really do watch too much football. But it was, <laughs> I think I watched three Champions League that, league games that night because, like, one of them was in, like, Russia or somewhere. So it was on at about five o'clock here. So it was perfect. Um, anyway, um, but Ajax were playing their old school total football again. And it was beautiful and it, it looked right. You know, those famous white shirts with the red stripe or sash. Playing total football looked right. United playing defensive football where they hope to hit teams on the counter. Ah, it is depressing to watch that. It's not United, is it? It's, it's a weird shell of united at the moment and they i don't know they don't they don't look right they've got one of the world's best players in paul pogba despite what Sunes says that is down to Mourinho not getting the best out of paul pogba because deschamps showed it in five six seven games whatever it was at the world cup how to play him and all of a sudden he looks like one of the world's best players again Mourinho's not doing that, and I think as Skull said, Messi could go. Skull said this last week, I think. Messi could go to Man United, and Jose Mourinho would make him worse and probably turn him into a left wing back. Yeah, you're probably right, actually. But in terms of um, their defence, that's also been a, an issue. They've on a negative goal difference, and they usually rely on David De Gea. So he's a different player this season, isn't he? So is that down to him? Is that down to the back four in front of him? Where's it all going wrong in the defensive third for United? Um, uh, that's another really tough one. Um, I, I, honestly, I don't. I, I don't know. I mean, I, th I think Dallow probably is going to need a bit, bit, bit more time to kind of blend into the the group. You know what I mean? But yeah. apart from that, it looks like. Uh, a really top centre back, so you can kind of be be a bit forgiving on that. Through the Moyes years and the Van Gaal years, whilst they are they are very good defenders, defenders like Smalling and Jones, for me, on of the quality United should have. You, you know what I mean? If if they can have well, not afford because they essentially swapped him with Mkhitaryan, but if they can go out and spend. 70 million on Fred or however much on Lukaku and get Sanchez in and all the rest of it. Why can't they go out there and sign someone like Matthias De Litt from Ajax? Why can't they go out and sign, I don't know, Godan or, you know, Alex, Ale Alexandra at left back from Juve? You know, you know what I mean? Why are they not getting the balance right in their transfer dealings because Smalling and Jones are very, very good players and they would still be a, a top team, wouldn't they? I mean, they are good players. They're, 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 they'd still probably get into, like, Arsenal. Um, at worst, they'd be playing for someone like Everton. But they're not United quality no, sort of that ship's slightly sailed now, isn't it? And they need to evolve in the back line. So I think not getting someone of the ilk of Harry Maguire or right. Vierald in the or Alder Vierald. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, you're right. They sort of, but then we don't even know how much of that was true, do yeah, we? Yeah, that is true. Honest. I mean, so, so many of those rumours are, are made up to drive betting and sell newspapers. Maybe maybe United never even wanted Danny Rose at any point. Maybe they never even wanted Alder Viral, but it sells copies. So you know, they, there you go. And I don't, I, they certainly didn't come in with a bid because we would have known about that. So how how strong could their interest have been? That is very true, isn't it? There's, like I say, it's all conjecture. And what do we really know? But what we yeah. do know is that Chelsea have dropped points, and there's just two teams now 
at the joint summit, and one of those is Liverpool. And they were made to work for the win against Huddersfield. Now, it wasn't a vintage performance of Jurgen Klopp's men, but is it one of those ones that sort of shows a championship winning pedigree? Because they're really, I know, I know people talk about it's what you do against the big six, but sometimes it's when the chips are down and you're not playing well and you still come away with three points. Sometimes they're the more important ones. Do you, I mean, do you, do you think they're any different from Spurs this year in that regard? Um, and I, 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 know, I know we fucked up at Watford, but we are now starting to win those gritty games. We did it at the weekend as well. Well, it's, it's actually going to be a later question, but I'll, I'll ask it now. So, I mean, yeah. had we beat Watford, we would have been top of the league. And, yeah. like, you know, there's a lot of what-ifs and all that. But it's Tottenham aren't playing that free-flowing football that they were known for a couple of seasons ago. No, no. Like Tottenham didn't win anything. Now, mm. would you take Tottenham just playing ugly and winning if it meant silverware? Do you know what I mean? Like this sort of real, sort of raw sort of set of performances. It's not great and it's not easy on the eye, but is that the difference that Tottenham need? I've, I've always said no to this question in the past because I'm Tottenham through and through and I love that we've always been an attacking, free-flowing club. But... Um, I think I would this season just to get the monkey off the back. You know what I mean? Just just to get it off the back, just to get people to shut up about it. But then you know what people will say. It will be like, oh, it was only the FA Cup or if we won the league, it will be like, it's only because City messed up or whatever. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you never get the credit. You we'll never get the credit. It will never happen. But yeah, I, I would take it this season. And that, that's why I drew the parallels with Liverpool and Spurs. We've we finished above we've finished above them. What is it? Eight out of nine years now. Yeah, that's right. Eight out of nine years. We finished above them last year. Liverpool have had a pretty similar start to us. What are they? I think they're only two points ahead of them. That's correct. Yep. We've had our best ever start to a Premier League season. We've had injuries, and we haven't hit anything like our best form yet. And yet, with, with the kind of this is a real media thing that they do. They love to build up the clubs like Liverpool and United when they're doing well, and they don't care about Tottenham. It doesn't matter that we've had more points under Pochettino than any other club has in that period in the league. Our season, if you read about how it's being presented to us as fans is that we've had this disastrous start to the season and Liverpool who have had an extremely similar start are now being talked out talked as genuine title winners and yeah something's gone a bit wrong there isn't it like yeah and and for me I, I think it's just just about it's just about equal. I, I, I think honestly, I still think City will win the league. I think I think Liverpool will have a dip at some point. All's clearly not right there. I mean, it's it's not fitting together quite yet. Spurs seems to be a little bit more on the same page. We've got our key players coming back, whereas largely that is Liverpool full strength and they're just not quite getting there but both both teams are winning ugly and that is like you say a measure of clubs that can put a title challenge in yeah i think you're right to be honest i mean it's just it's not really fashionable to talk to tottenham as bona fide title contenders but when you lay it out and you sort of say well liverpool are doing all this and Tottenham are doing all this, they're not a million miles apart, so why would you sort of put... All well, of course, yeah, of course we are. It's, it's not even like saying, on on that note, it's not saying like, oh, everyone should be going nuts and saying, oh, look at Spurs, they've had these injuries, they've, uh, they're still winning ugly, they're only two points off the top and all the rest of it, you know. But actually, our coverage has been, oh, it's been a disaster and blah, 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 and it's like, we've actually just had our best start to a season, and yet Liverpool... They're, they're very, very similar starts, and yet they're the t they're, they really are just being raved about as title contenders, and I find it weird because everyone started raving about them last year, but they finished below us. Absolutely. I mean, like I say, if we beat Watford, we would have been top, but would you still see the narrative as not being considered title contenders because, you know, it just doesn't fit 
the agenda for this season? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it does fit the agendas for this season. I, I think most of the media, because Liverpool, and a lot of this stuff, don't forget, is done on traffic and therefore ad, ad, advertising revenue. Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. Um, so the clickbait stuff. And Liverpool have got a lot of very, 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 very passionate fans who will take the clickbait, you know what I mean, and run with it. If they write something even remotely negative, they know that's going to get loads of stuff. So, yeah, I, I do think the media want to win, want Liverpool to win it this year. You know, I don't remember the Sergio Aguero documentary when he literally won the league for Man, Man City. And to highlight the point we're making, Salah has won admittedly great season. Channel 4 did a a one-hour hagiography on him. <laughs> you know, I haven't seen Kane's one of those. No, or true, true. You know, it's ridiculous. Well, it's like when football365.com just have multiple Arsenal articles because they know that drives the traffic, which drives their revenue. And it's just like, yeah. you can just see through it straight away, can't you? So, And we, we as Spurs fans need to start doing better on not clicking about the negative stuff on us because it drives their revenue up. Yeah. That's what we need to do is when they're like, Oh, you know, if if Lopetegui does get sacked, a million articles will be about Pochettino leaving. Don't click on them. Don't give them money. Starve their oxygen because they're shit. Absolutely. If you stop feeding the machine, then these articles go away very quickly. But and that goes for all of talk sport as well. Yeah, exactly. The Adrian Durham thing, it's like Moss to a flame. And he, mm. just, he says a comment, and you, you can see it a mile off. And people just, just latch onto it and have this, and it just, you know, people retweet that, it and they comment, you're like, what are you doing? Just leave them alone. Like, oh, it's, ox it's oxygen. It drives, it drives, you know, listenership and blah, blah, blah. They'll know. Adrian Durham actually isn't a stupid bloke. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He's mo mo most of that will be coming down from the, pr the producers and the managers saying, oh, look, we've got these metrics that say when you say something controversial about dot, 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 or you call this player shit, we get a spike in engagement and all of the rest of it, you know. We need to be more savvy as fans, and we need to do more about getting the message out about this, because people aren't idiots. But when they see it there, it's so easy to react so quickly on the social media, and so you just write stuff like, fuck you, Dar Durham, you ginger, you know what I mean, and all the rest of it, and it, it just goes like that, and it's like, stop feeding them, then you, then us as readers, as fans, will start getting better coverage, and we can start to trust the media again, because they'll be forced to do it. Yeah, you're absolutely right, but unfortunately there's a lot of uh, low-hanging fruit out there, isn't there, so... Exactly. They Oh, and that, that's my rant for the week. I think that should be a section any time I'm yeah, on. Yeah, I think we can have that. Well, <laughs> I can't tell you when it's going to come now. I just get triggered as the kids. That's all right. Don't <laughs> I, need like a, I need a klaxon or something. Like. But let's, um, let's get back to some on-pitch action. And we go yeah, and the, and the klaxon can just uh, keep sounding whilst I'm speaking <laughs> so, everyone, so everyone else doesn't have to listen to it. Drowns it out. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, right. Yeah. If we go back to Tottenham, and the history books will say that Eric Lamella got the winner, but in fairness, you've got to give that accolade to Hugo Lloris, really, haven't you? Because three fantastic saves were ultimately the difference against West Ham on Saturday. I actually, you know, this is weird because this is the first time this ever happened on here. Was actually having this discussion about Hugo Lloris, and I said I would still have him in the top five world keepers. Basically, his mistakes get pounced on and highlighted more than anyone else. But I'm one of those weird people. I love goalkeepers. I don't think they get the credit they deserve. They only seem to be in the news when they make a mistake, i.e. Loris Karius at Liverpool last year, etc., etc. But in terms of shot-stopping, he's definitely in the top five of the world. In terms of organising his defence, he's in the top five of the world as the sweeper-keeper thing. Maybe top six, seven. His distributions, let's say, become a little bit more patchy the last few years. But... The important things he does, leading his team from the back, organising the defence well, and being a world-class shot stopper, puts him in there. 
And I think that was a vintage Hugo display and answered a lot of his critics. And I, I was chuffed for him at the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. It's exactly what he needed. Obviously, that shaky start, not even on the pitch, just you know, through injury and whatnot. Right. And driving all that. It just He just needed it. And it was like, he's back. And I think if we can mm. have more of that, it also gives confidence to Tottenham's back four as well. Because we tried the same tactic against right. Watford, where we went in, went ahead and then decided to let the opposition on to us. But we had Michelle Vorm in goal. And that was the difference, I think. Mm. We had Maurice in goal against Watford and deployed those same kind of tactics. I think we would have won. We'd have been top, but Salavi, that's life, isn't it? Although I do, I do think Paolo Gasaniga looks very good. Yeah, yeah, as you call it as well. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> he well, yeah. helped start the run, didn't he? Win against Brighton, so he, d- he did. And also, what what I would say about Larice, and you, you touched on it very well about um, instilling confidence in the defence. Davinson Sanchez needs that because he's suddenly thrown into a back two with. Um, Jan Vertonghen or you know back three whatever it is if Dyer's going to drop in there and he's a young lad who's I mean he just looks incredible I love Sanchez but he needs that calm head behind him he needs to know his goalkeeper's not going to make mistakes he's going to back him up because he, he has looked a little bit lost in that new formation the last couple of games Sanchez and I think that will benefit him the most. Um, before we move on from Spurs, can I just give a... <laughs> I never thought was, <laughs> I didn't think these words would ever leave my lips, but really quick shout out to um, Musa Sissoko. Yeah, if you want, yeah. Hey, ge- genuinely. No, you've I've, I've, right. been, I've been one of his biggest critics over the last two years, largely because when you watched him with France at the Euros, he was one of the best three players. And I thought that's what we need. We need that ball carrier who can just suddenly pick it up deep and, you know, run through loads of people and set up opportunities. And he, he hadn't really been doing it for Spurs. I don't know whether it was a confidence thing. I don't know whether it was because he came on during games we needed to see out or game manage, but when he came on the the other night, who did he come on against? Struggling to remember now. Um, oh God. who did he? Who did we beat before West Ham? He beat yeah, Cardiff. Um, yeah, Cardiff. Yes. And when when he came on, he actually started to make a few of those runs, and I thought, yes, Moose, that's that's the one we want to see, you know. And then he did it a lot at the weekend, and I thought that was easily his best game in a Spurs shirt. Admittedly, the bar's not that high, but he suddenly looked like he didn't look out of place in the team, you know? And that was completely exemplified by his cross, which, let's be honest, that was on his weaker foot. That was his left foot, that cultured little delivery into Lamella to the... Header and Lamella Bell even needed to generate any pace, it was so good. And yeah, that, that's all I wanted to say. Basically, big, big kudos to uh, Suzuko. My theory was that he basically got kidnapped straight after the Euros two years ago. <laughs> He's uh, has been has been trapped in someone's basement. They 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 sent out a, a look like you know, they they wouldn't. They thought we wouldn't notice the difference because they think we're all racist and black people look the same. So they thought they'd just send someone who looks a bit like him out there. And he wasn't a footballer, he was just like a chartered accountant or something, you know. <laughs> and then and then Sissoko managed to finally tunnel his way out, Shawshank Redemption style, and he's come back. He killed the other guy off. Um, snapped his neck, one one uh, one thing, you know, ninja movie style, and we seem to suddenly have the Musa Sissoko we actually signed. It sounds like a relatively plausible explanation, and uh, <laughs> one may continue. Over to Fulham now, and I've said a couple of weeks now that their goals could be enough to keep them up, but at the same time, it is their leaky defence that will send them oh. down. 25 goals have been shipped in their first nine matches. That's 2.77 per game, which in any currency is relegation form. Now, Slavisa Kihanovic is a man who likes to play open, expansive football, but surely that's going to have to change if they are to beat the drop. Now, JS, does this boil down to tactical naivety? Is he too rigid in his ways, thinking, I've got a system that's worked previously, and that's the only way we're going to do stuff? 
Or is there something else that's underlying there? What's your take on all things Fulham? I think they've got... <clears throat> I think they've got quite a lot of new pl players to bed in. Um, some teams seem to be able to do it a little more quickly than others, but you have to you have to bear in mind as well. Um, they have got like they've had they've also had defenders out injured. You know, like Le Marchand wasn't um, uh, wasn't available for a few games. Um, uh, it's it's gonna take time. I think they'll be okay though. Um, I don't think they'll go down simply because I think there are three teams worse than them. You know. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, like I said, they've got enough goals to keep them up. So this mm -hmm. it's not a quick fix, but it's something that can be solved quite quickly in the sense that well, just said it's not a quick fix, but you know what I mean. It's the sense that. They only need a couple of tweaks. They just need I to be agree. a bit more pragmatic. Yes. And then they should be fine because it doesn't really change what they do in the final two-thirds of the pitch. It's almost but, what, what they're doing. But, but then, like you said earlier, uh, was it, oh, it might not have been you. It might have been someone else. But some, right. so, some, some managers have their favourite players, don't they? Or, they, they st or, you know, you're talking about him being rigid. They love a certain system. They love a certain way of playing, etc., etc. He he does need to learn how to be a bit more pragmatic because it's a little bit like what's happening with Kimmich at Bayern in Germany at the moment. It it isn't it isn't working. Yogi Love refuses to employ him in any other way, and now Kovac has actually had quite a poor start at Bayern. Yep employing him the same way so if you look at fulham yes actually they've got some great attacking players in there setting seems to be finally sort of coming to grips with the premier league andre Schurler, yeah obviously is not at his peak but you never lose a base level of talent when you're that good and he's going to help them a lot. They've got Mitrovic, who can score. He's a bullying sense forward. That's what he should be doing. He should be... He's not bullying people enough at the moment. It's almost like he's too respectful of some of them. You know what I mean? Especially with Arsenal. He should have been sort of um, get, getting in their face. You know, that that's what they need. They need a little bit more grit to go with that attacking flair. Whether that's in... <clears throat> You know, recruiting in in um, in January, maybe one or two more, or maybe it's in, like you say, just slightly tweaking it. So, yeah, it's a little bit more pragmatic and work on the defensive side a lot in training. But I don't know. They're exciting. They're fun to watch. It's kind of like they're kind of like a really bad version of how Spurs used to be. Their their, their philosophy seems to be. We'll just try and outscore whoever we're playing, you know. Yeah, I mean, they've certainly been a decent addition to the Premier League, but I think they need to change things if they want to be there for Defin the season. De def definitely agree, mate. They need to sort it out defensively. I do think they'll be all right, though. I think it's a little bit of false economy. They, they, they had really bad luck with defensive injuries early on, um, and they are bedding in pretty much half of a new team. In fact, I think... There's only about two or three of them who played in the, the championship last year in their, their first choice 11, isn't there? Yeah, something like that. I mean, I think they will be fine. I mean, I don't think they're going to put up too many trees. It might be sort of 16th no, or 15th, I... but I think they'll just be on the right side of the dotted line. Which uh, leads us to our loser pool picks of the week. Now, last week, it was a bit of a mixed bag because uh, my two guests got it wrong. Um, Matthew, who was on the show for the first time, who had a cracking debut trying to kick stuff into the bin. Um, he went for, <laughs> um, went for Brighton to lose at Newcastle. Got that wrong. Uh, mm. Cole went for our, um, should I say, our second favourite team in this podcast, Wolves. He, they went, he went for a Wolves win, so that was a Watford pick. Wrong. And I was the only one who got one right, and even me nearly got that wrong, because Everton Palace was nil-nil with about, what, 86 minutes to go. Oh, crazy. But, but thankfully... Crazy. I've never celebrated an Evan goal so much as uh, Palace lost 2-0. So, <laughs> um, a, uh, well, yeah, I came out on top last week, but we reset the clock to zero as we go this week. So, Cole, ha who... So, um, 
let, let, let me get this right. Despite yeah. the fact that I've not been on for a couple of weeks. Well, you sort of bugger the league format. To be honest. Let's just say you won because you've sort of you've had. Yeah, a, I was going to say. So, so let me get this right. You basically reset it because I was winning. Well, I think I'm just going to have to do sort of weekly picks because I can't. <laughs> I can't there's no sort of continuity from week to week or unless because <laughs> I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like, I need to work a new format. So, congratulations. Uh, JS, you are our autumn champion, shall I say? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I'll yeah, take so that. You, yeah, you've won the yeah. first silverware of the season, the first loser pool prize. Um, but mm. now let's see if you're on a good for your money this week. Um, <laughs> so, Cole, who uh, can't join us because it's an early recording, so big shout out to Cole as always. He'll be back with us next week. He's gone. Um, he's gone for Spurs, his own Spurs, to lose at home to Manchester City on Monday. Now... State of you, Carl. Yeah. Um, yes. Terrible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I can see why he's done it. Do I agree with it? No. So, um... It's I don't tough. actually agree. I think we'll draw that. Yeah. I mean, it's my birthday on Monday, so I'm going to that game, and I would love nice. at, least, at least a point. That's all I ask, Tottenham. But, um... <laughs> yes, Carl's gone for Spurs to lose at home to City... I, that is, that is su such a Spurs fan, fan thing to do. Yes, I like you know it. I mean? it's like, yeah, no, no, we'll lose to City. Yeah, that's fine. The glass yeah. is definitely um, half empty on that one. Um, I, I don't think Keith has a glass. No, that's yeah, it's just spilled everywhere. But um, I, <laughs> I backed Everton last week to win. I'm now going to flip that around, and I reckon they're going to lose at home to Man. Sorry, away to Man United, mm -hmm. um, which. I know United aren't, you know, great at the moment, but I just think, I don't know. I mean, they've sort of, they have got four points out of six. If they can get the first goal, then I think they should be fine. But knowing my luck, that could end up being a draw. And that's not to say, I'll, you know. I'll, I'll, I'd go a draw on that one, Ooh. but I'm not I'm not going to talk you out of it. No, now, that's fine. So. I just, I'm going for that one. And uh, JS, as um, autumn champion of our losable picks, is a, uh, Gone with quite an easy pick this week, but I think that's the champion's right, as he's gone with uh, Cardiff to lose away at Liverpool. So, I mean, really, I don't think we're going to learn anything from that one. Um, be a shock if it doesn't happen. Um, I don't think you really need to explain either why, Carl, do you? Jace. Yes. yes. Whatever. I was like, wait, Cole's not here, is he's he? He's just, just radioing um, in. Just radioing so, in, but... in. In my head, even though I knew he wasn't here, I was just waiting for him to speak then. So I was like, yeah, okay. Um, I Basically, I've got all of mine right so far. You have. Uh, actually, if you are so... following at home, just always mm. follow what JS does because he always gets them right. So if anything, it's more about a an undefeated streak that we're playing for now. Can JS beat football? That's the game we'll be playing for the rest of the season. <laughs> Can JS beat football? So yeah, the Cardiff, guess... Cardiff, Cardiff, Cardiff. Yes. They're, they're, they're going to. I think Liverpool will finally hit a bit of their stride and hammer them like three 0 or something. Always oh, giving us a score as well. Actually, I like that. Maybe we should have them to back them up as well. But good idea. I think you're about right. Uh, best do some admin. So the apologies this week go to uh, Newcastle and Brighton fans. That was a, a decent sort of a topic but it's you know not going well for Newcastle so probably best we didn't mention that again apologies to uh, Wolves and Watford fans didn't have time for that one Everton Palace we just about spoke to spoke about for a second or two so that one's covered Bournemouth Southampton that just happened any nil nil doesn't get any time of day on this show so that's the rules I, I don't even watch them a match of the day if it's nil nil it does not exist so um, <laughs> that's the admin bit I guess if you want to get in touch with me you can as I said on Twitter at Dan Tracy 1983 if you want to get um, in touch in terms of comments, feedback, if you want to be on the show, uh, get in touch with me and we'll, we'll give you a space during the season. JS, an excellent run out this afternoon, um, earlier than usual that we do. But as always, it's an absolute pleasure coming on. I know you can't um, offer your time weekly, but when you do, it's always much appreciated. And I really look forward to picking up this again soon. Brilliant, Dan. Thanks for having me. I'm probably a bit less drunk than normal as well. Well, you know, day, just so. any time is <laughs> absolutely, mate. There we drink, go. drink as much as we want this show. It's an 18 plus show, so that's absolutely fine. And with that said, <laughs> it just leaves you to say that my name's Dan Tracy. This is the Real Football Cast in association with Loser Paul. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>